good evening good evening ladies and gentlemen a very warm welcome to the 5th edition of the annual s mutaya memorial lecture we the colors of glory foundation are hosting this year in collaboration with the madras management association i am samyukta vijay shankar your mc for the event before we commence please bear with me for a few minutes while i profile our foundation for the benefit of those who may have not attended our prior events our country has any number of heritage organizations for almost every sphere of human activity be it art literature politics or any other somehow warfare alone does not enjoy this privilege despite the fact that we have a rich military past which very few other countries in the world can match this is the anomaly that our founders set about to rectify 8 years ago by raising our foundation we have come a long way since carving a niche for ourselves with drive and dedication let me play a 2 minute audio clip to you so that uh, you know it eloquently uh, conveys the essence of our mission that being our mission let me treat you to some glimpses of the road we have traveled so far hosting multiple events in a 3 minute video
That's only part of the story because it covers mostly the outdoor activities and not the indoor events like talks, presentations, and innumerable virtual events we conducted during the pandemic and those we continue to host. We are spreading our wings too with outreach programs, the first of which we hosted in Bangalore last year and are poised to host many more of its kinds in other cities as well. We have a Pan-India membership base and some overseas members as well. We invite those of you who are not members to obtain a membership and be part of this unique initiative. An annual membership costs only 1,000 rupees and a lifetime membership 10,000 rupees. Our membership is unique for its feature where the spouse of the member gets automatic membership. Our volunteers outside will be happy to explain the modalities of obtaining a membership and the benefits thereof. We look forward to welcoming many more of you into our fold. I now invite our chief guest and speaker for the day, Mr. Shrikumar Varma and Captain D.P. Ramchandran, who will be chairing the meeting to take their seats in the dais, please. May I invite Group Captain R. Vijay Kumar, Executive Director, Madras Management Association, to deliver the welcome address. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's indeed a proud privilege for me to be here uh, to deliver the formal welcome address. Uh, I do this differently today. You've been watching me every day doing something differently because when we collaborate, we really go by what the collaborator wants it and we do that way. That's a, one of the principles of collaboration. We are indeed privileged to present you today the Mutya Memorial Lecture, uh, joining with Colors of Glory. Being an ex-serviceman, so I don't want to talk about mm -hmm. Colors of Glory. I will run miles to collaborate with organizations like Colors of Glory who really bring in uh, some of the outstanding achievements of uh, the Defence Forces and showcase to them. Because that's the only way to, not only to show the prowess of our country and also encourage a lot of young people and a lot of professionals, make them uh, really, you know, envy to, uh, of themselves and to join the armed forces. That's the intention of Colour of Glory and uh, I really urge upon you, it's a nice place to be in and uh, I'm also a like member of Colours of Glory. You will really add a lot of value to you and uh, like the way MMA adds to you actually. Now, uh, coming to today's evening, it's uh, Muttaya Memorial Lecture. What to talk about Mr. Muttaya, one of the outstanding personality. And anybody in Chennai, anything you talk about the book, you will talk about Muttaya. When Captain Ramchandran uh, asked me to that he would like to use this facility and uh, 
do this uh, event here. Then I said, why don't we do it together? Because it's a privilege and honor for me to join Colors of Glory and also be a memory lecture for Muthiya. It's uh, another icing of the cake. What, what do you want to do? That, that's the reason we, <coughs> we are here to collaborate and do this event. Now, uh, let me warmly welcome the distinguished uh, speaker, chief guest for this evening, uh, Sri Kumar Varma. Very, it's a pleasure to have you with us, sir. And he'll be talking on a very, very interesting theme, Lives of a Writer, Exploring Beyond the Book. And uh, I especially want to listen to him, and I'm quite sure you all think. Uh, if you also know, I think many of you know, he's, uh, think he's a great, great grandson of Raja Ravi Varma. I don't think there's any house in Chennai which would not have the picture of Raja Ravi Varma's painting, the beautiful Saraswati, Lakshmi, and many of them. And it's a really privilege to have you with us this evening at MMA, sir. Uh, and eagerly looking forward to hearing your thought-provoking views on the subject which you are going to be speaking. And I want to talk about Captain Ramachandran. Captain Ramachandran is... Uh, in fact, we all would like to emulate him. He's a person who really inspires. Uh, in fact, I can tell you he's a role model because uh, the way the way he, he conducts a program, the way he takes care of uh, uh, no item at this young age, uh, I think it's really, really phenomenal and tremendous. I think it's a privilege to really work with you and do the event today, sir. Welcome to you. Also, welcome uh, the past president of MM Nagaraj. Good to have you with us this evening, sir. Pleasure to have you with us. Other members of MMA, members of the managing committee, student members. All the viewers watching this program live from all the channels. As usual, if you have any questions, there's a number on your screen. Please uh, type that question, send it to the number. Our team will compile and place all the questions before the distinguished speaker this evening. And only I request you to focus your question to the theme, what you are doing. Let me tell you uh, briefly a uh, few lines uh, about MMA because some of you are new who have come. MMA is established in 1956 and uh, we have over 8,000 members uh, and we do some 750 events in a year and um, for being uh, doing so many events together and good and we are recognized as number one management association in India for the last 14 years in a row, including for the last year. So, plus we have a state of art uh, building which you are in today, uh, it's about 24,000 square foot. We got multiple facilities, got classrooms, you got state of art library with 1.25 million e-line books and research papers, e-books, ma magazine, videos, uh, uh, anything you want to know, it's available for you. So we got very good facilities and uh, we do large number of events and uh, do come and uh, always a pleasure to have you with us at MMA. And before I, I formally hand it over to Captain Ramchandran, let me briefly tell you as usual every time my members uh, request me to do this so that they don't miss the next event. Next event is on 18th April, we have uh, as usual the Read and Grow. Uh, the, to sell is human is a theme. Then we have on 25th April, not to be missed event, uh, arbitration in the age of globalization, navigating cross-border disputes in India's business landscape. We have got Ram Subramaniam, um, judge of Supreme Court, and plus we got some outstanding panel. Uh, they'll be coming and talking to you on something which is very, very relevant today when you are in a globalized world and doing business with all part of the world. Then on 30th, again, very, very interesting event. Uh, uh, you must have seen newspapers. A lot of discussion happening on this ad on a particular product, uh, which I don't want to tell them. But you all know what I'm talking about. Ad was making co <coughs> competition healthy. Why we want to really impress upon not only our members and others that you should always underpromise and over deliver. You should not misguide, mislead through your advertisements, actually. We have got Manish Kapoor, uh, Miss Manish Kapoor, the CEO of uh, Secretary General of the Ad uh, Standard Council from Mumbai. Then we have got Ilango, we got Shashank Singh. We have got some outstanding panel to come and speak. How you should care? Because sometimes inadvertently you could do that something, you know, Instagram, Facebook, and claim for some product which it really doesn't, you know, you're going to see this trouble. They go to consumer court, uh, you will be in trouble. You know, the Supreme Court has come heavily on one of the product which you all, including me, we're using it actually. Then we have a number of other events, uh, I don't want to really think, uh, planned for till June. Some outstanding events do come. And uh, once again, very warm welcome to all the members who have come for the first time here in MMA. We look forward to seeing you more. And uh, thank you, Captain Ramachandran. It's always a pleasure to interact with you and work with you. Uh, once again, thanks to everyone. Enjoy the evening. Thank you. And uh, looking forward to a great evening. I now have the honor to introduce the two dignitaries on stage. First, our chief guest, Mr. Shrikumar Varma, who will be delivering the S. Muthaya Memorial Lecture. Mr. Varma is an accomplished author, playwright, poet columnist, reviewer, and translator. His work includes the novels Lament of Mohini, Maria's Room, Kipling's Daughter, Devil's Garden, and The Mag Magic Store of Nu Cham Vu. Also the historical book Palisi Raja, The Royal Rebel. His plays include 
Bow of Rama, The Dark Lord, Platform, Midnight Hotel, Cast Party, Ganga at Rishikesh, and Five. He is the recipient of the R.K. Narayanan Award and the Charles Wallace, Charles Wallace Fellowship, besides having been the writer in residence at the Stirling University in Scotland. His diverse literary contributions span from publishing the fortnightly Trident to being the jury of various prestigious literary awards. As a prolific columnist, he has contributed to leading publications such as the Times of India, the Hindu, Indian Express, and others. A proud descendant of the Travancore royal family, a celebrated ra artist, uh, Raja Ravi Verma, he is married with two sons and a daughter-in-law. Now, <laughs> let me introduce you to our founder and chairman, Captain D.P. Ramchandran, who is chairing this meeting. Captain Ramchandran is a distinguished war veteran and military historian who has authored three war books with the fourth underway. His first book, Legion of the Brave, is a hands-on account of the 1971 Bangladesh War. The second, Empire's First Soldier, is a battlefield history of the South Indian soldiery. And the third, Indian Army Through the Battles Over the Century, is a comprehensive account of all those all the wars the Indian Army has fought, while the fourth soon-to-be-published work is, on un is called Unconquered Horizon. This tells the tales of valorous icons of southern India who resisted colonism, often at the cost of their own lives. Through the Colors of Glory Foundation, he maintains an active offline and online presence, fostering the appreciation for Indians, India's rich military legacy. I may now invite him to offer his opening remarks. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'll take only a couple of minutes. Uh, that's just to tell you about our uh, association with Mr. Mutaya. Mr. Mutaya was uh, best known for his love of Madras. I mean, he insisted being called the chronicle of Madras and nothing else, although he was much more than that. One facet of his personality, a lesser known facet of his personality, was his admiration for the armed forces. In, he, he, he almost regretted that he didn't have an opportunity to serve in arms. But he made up for it, more than made up for it, with his extensive reading on military history. In fact, his uh, knowledge of the two world wars was so phenomenal that it, Anyone reads his book, Born to Dare, on his one World War II hero and his close friend, Lieutenant General Indrajit Singh Gill, one would get the impression that he was an officer in the British or Indian Army. It is his, this affinity towards armed forces that is, which helped us have him on board as one of our founding trustees when we raised Colors of Glory Foundation. He was our intellectual beacon in those initial years when you're finding your feet as a heritage organization. That is what inspired us to institute this lecture when we lost him after his having been with us only for three years. This year, I mean, I'm thankful to Emma May who has joined us to, in this effort. This year in particular, we are gratified that we are we were able to host it on his birthday itself. And more significant than that, for our speaker, we have one of his most accomplished students. I mean, his achievements are so much that we had to condense his receipt for the MC, uh, uh, his resume for the MC. Uh, I deem it my proud privilege now to invite him to deliver the lecture, which I'm sure all of you are eagerly waiting for. All yours. I was actually going to do this extempore, but then I saw Group Captain Vijay Kumar's description 
of what I would be saying. Transcending the mere act of writing to explore the profound influences, experiences and passions that shape their creative existence. And I thought I might as well write down what I have to say. So I'm going to read this out. And this will not be a very casual thing. Uh, Captain Ramchandran, thank you so much for thinking of me for this great honor today. And Group Captain Vijay Kumar, thank you for keeping me, keeping in touch all these days and welcoming me here. My gratitude to Colors of Glory and the Madras Management Association. My dear friends, thank you all for being here today. When you wake up tomorrow morning, please remember that I was the first to wish you a very happy Vishu and a beautiful Tamil Putand. My love and respect to the memory of Mr. Mutaya. I first met Mr. Mutaya 47 years ago. He was my teacher first, later became a friend, and was a constant source of inspiration. One of the last events he attended was the launch of my novel, Kipling's Daughter. He was ill and too weak to climb up to the dais. He spoke sitting in a chair below. He said, I'm not too well, but how can I refuse one of my favorite students? This is something which I will remember till the end of my days. I remember again his love and his determination to come there despite everything. There was also a time when I began to write a book on Madras. It began as a mission. Whenever I lost my momentum and focused on my other literary work, like a divine reminder, there would be a little nudge from Mr. Mutaya, either in his columns or he'd bring up the topic when we met. But, when I, but afterwards I got caught up in other projects and so many other, other people began to write about Madras and I gave up this project altogether. I think I was one of the first who called him Mr. Madras in one of my columns. And that is how he was to me, a mentor in so many ways and a master of Madras. So I'm truly honored to be a part of this memorial event. Mr. Mutaya began as a sign of the times for me. During the last year of my MA in literature, I also joined a journalism course at Bhavans. One of my classmates, Anand Poneya, is sitting here with us today. Those days, I used to have a diary in which I took down notes. I also used to draw the faces of our lecturers. Some years ago, I saw it lying around, and there was Mr. Mutaya's face, large and smiling. The much younger face that I knew in 1977. Mr. Mutaya took our editing class. It was like an omen because the next year I joined the Madras Law College and there was a big strike that year against the introduction of the semester system. So in desperation, I applied to the Indian Express and got the job. So there I was in Bombay, in Express Towers, at Narman Point, a journalist instead of a lawyer. After the Express, I also worked for a film industry paper run by the Producers Association that we revamped and renamed Cinema Today. Things have happened to me and they always made sense later on. And even when they didn't make sense, it felt really good. There are basically two kinds of people. The ones who think we are guided and controlled by some higher force which we call fate or fortune or God. And those who believe that life is a match played between us and the world and that we can create our own moments and pathways. I belong to a subcategory that believes in the power of the moment, where the past shapes us and thoughts about the future guide us, but we still live in the moment. And sometimes I'm rational and full of myself, and sometimes I feel protected by God or the universe. If there is indeed a powerful force that oversees us, we are still not simply toys of God, 
but rather instruments of God or even versions of God. I think that the universe has a pattern, a rhythm and a music that can guide you if you recognize it and make it a part of your own life. Which is why when I write a short story or a play or a novel, I may be God or the creator, but I give my characters enough room to maneuver and decide and manage their own stories. The plot is loose enough, the characters are free enough until the point where I reach the end and finish the book. I say this because there have been many instances where my characters saw other paths than what I had plotted for them and took the story through completely different routes all on their own. After coming back to Madras from Bombay, I started a printing press along with two partners who were older than my father and then a city magazine along with my wife. She's also sitting here in this hall with us, my life partner and muse, Geeta. There is this thing about journalism. It helps to lay a foundation if you want to become a writer. You work on stories, you interview people and understand their persona. You bring strands of information and opinion together and then you plot your story, which is what journalism is all about. And so from that time onwards, there was this desire in me to write a novel. During my school days, I had already started a magazine. On a full scrap sheet, I wrote with a pen and I drew pictures and traced out photos. Close relatives were forced to read it, even if they didn't want to buy it. During my early college days, I had already written a novel. I wrote it in three notebooks with a fountain pen. It was set in Egypt and it was a murder mystery. I wanted someone to read it and no one would. So I did a really nasty thing. I went to my grandmother and read it out to her. She was in bed and she couldn't leave even if she wanted to. Day after day, chapter after chapter, I sat and read out the whole novel to her. At one time she had ruled at Ravencourt State. Now here she was forced to listen to my novel. At the end she said she liked it and of course I believed her wholeheartedly. I don't know where that novel is now, where those three notebooks are now. In the mid-90s I started writing my new novel. There was a small room behind our house and I'd sit at the computer typing. I wasn't very dedicated though. I only wrote when it was convenient. One night a thief broke in and made off with my music system and my computer. It was a terrible shock. The computer had about 25% of my novel. When people consoled me, I said, that's okay, he's just a fan who wanted to be the first to read my novel. But I was deeply hurt. That incident perked me up. I started writing in earnest. I had some of my handwritten notes. I shut myself up in my room and wrote and wrote. We got a watchman for the house to discourage more fans like that. But this wasn't my first published work. I had a dear friend who worked at Macmillan. To celebrate the 50th year of independence, they were bringing out small volumes on freedom fighters and they were meant for children. I decided to write on Parshi Raja. My wife's aunt was married into the Parshi royal family member, was married to a Parshi royal family member and he arranged an interview with his uncle. That's the patriarch of the family. The Parshi tour and the interview were rounded off with pages and pages of Logan's manual and other British revenue records which were sent to be my, my friend Sukumar Nambiar. The dear friend from Macmillan who gave me the project is also present here with us today, Dr. Mini Krishnan. Where is she? She's sitting. Dr. Mini Krishnan? Could you? Yeah, she was there with us. I don't know if she's left now. Okay. Uh, seeing my first published work triggered my enthusiasm and I completed my first novel. It was called Lament of Mohini. Like most serendipitous things in my life, 
my friend Chetan Shah introduced me to a wonderful literary agent named Jayapriya Vasudevan, who pitched the book to Penguin. The novel was long listed for the Crossword Award. They say your first novel generally has a lot of yourself in it. Lament of Mohini was based on a royal family and a Namutri family. The protagonist worked in a printing press like me. There are so many things you hear about as children. It includes legends and family tales and sheer gossip. My father lived in a joint family in Kilimanur, the same family where Raja Ravi Verma was born. It was a storehouse of stories, some poignant, some funny. Many of them found a place in my novel. But I was in for a few surprises. I had based my descriptions of a Nambudri house and household on a book written by Geeta's great uncle. When I actually visited a similar house for the first time after the book was published, the descriptions were startlingly, startlingly similar. And then an incident in my novel of a doomed love affair between a Nambudri woman and a royal family member was not just similar, but exactly the same as a true story of a Nambudri's love that I heard long after the book was finished. It was, you, uh, you cannot enter a Nambudri ilam. They say that if, if it's a Nambudri woman, she goes there as a girl who's married and she comes out after she's dead. She's brought back out after she's dead. Even if she goes to visit the uh, temple or the uh, pond to have a bath, she's swathed in cl uh, cloth and there's a, uh, an umbrella which covers her. That's how she goes unseen by anybody. But in this case, uh, there is a performance happening inside the Illam or the uh, Nambudri house. And uh, among the invitees is this protagonist, uh, royal family member. And he is here and he gets a headache and he goes out and has a nap in one of the outhouses there. Then he comes back to the house. And it, it has started raining by then. So when the rain grows very heavy, he uh, runs into a bathhouse. And in that bathhouse, he sees this girl swimming. And that's how they first meet. Nobody else knows. There's a uh, rain which covers everything. The performance is going on there. Later, before the, after the book was published, I realized that there was a true story that happened. And this was exactly how it happened. A pond in the Nambudri Illam, where nobody else could enter. At this point of time, this man goes there, this girl is there, and that's how the love affair begins. So I believe in serendipity, but this was positively weird. Gita used to tell me that my personality changed when in the thick of writing. If it was a dark story, then God bless. Which is probably why there's so much humor in my work. It's so much, it's, it's some much needed tension, uh, some, some much needed relief from the tension in the work. After this, we went to Goa to relax for a while. There we visited the Mahalasa temple. They told us that the deity was also known as Mohini. Since my novel was called Lament of Mohini, I promised the priests there that I would come again sometime with a copy of the book as an offering. So when we, we visited next, I had my novel with me. When we reached Goa, it was re raining heavily, completely in contrast to the sunny Goa we expected. Our cab from the station couldn't make it after a while because the roads were flooded. We needed a larger vehicle. So the driver flogged, flagged down an SUV and we got in with our luggage. We'd driven for some time before I realized that there was another couple in the car. They were seated behind, almost unseen, very silent. The driver dropped them somewhere along the way and they got out silent and brooding. It was a trigger. It gave birth to a new idea. Forced to spend a lot of time in our room because of the rain, I started writing. And this story was about a writer from Chennai, an old story from Portugal, and the new Goan state, an artist and a beautiful girl. 
Back in Chennai, I asked my historian friend Abraham Irali where I could get material on early Goa. I still remember his reply. Is it a novel, Shri Kumar? Then forget those history books. So I read upon basic history, but relied on my imagination for the rest. It was a story that suited its dark, rain-lashed background. A psychological study of a doomed relationship. The novel was long listed for the first Man Asian Literary Prize. I was also happy with the book much later for another reason. It was converted into a special audio file, with my permission, for the use of blind readers. In any school or college library, there is a long line to get access to books in Braille. An audio format is of great help, but most publishers and authors are wary of permitting this because of the fear of piracy. Maria's Room and my children's book, The Magic Store of Nuchamvu, came out in a format for the blind to read. If my first children's book came out in the late 90s and my first novel was launched along with the new century in 2000, I had already begun my innings as a playwright in 1986. I entered a British Council one-act play competition with no background or experience except for a bag full of curiosity. The play was called The Dark Lord. It was directed by today's veteran Venod Anand and featured, among others, a 20-year-old Anita Nair as an 80-year-old woman. The play won second prize. I was so happy and surprised that I didn't write another play for almost a decade. Then came another competition, this time for a full-length play. It was sponsored by the Hindu and the Madras players. I wrote a play based on an earlier short story of mine. It was called Bo of Rama, and it won the first prize. Again, it took me 10 years to recover from the shock. When the Madras players celebrated its 50th year, they asked me for a play. I wrote Platform, which was directed by a dear friend, Yamuna, who is now in Bangalore. It was only in my place that I really began to experiment with form and content. The novel is too big and the uh, story sort of flows, so you can't do much with it except for a broad idea of how to uh, you know, make it, keep it different from the usual. But in a, a play, uh, you can experiment with it, you can do your own thing with it. In platform, every alternate scene had the same actors in different roles and stories. When your train stops at a station, you see strangers gathered on a bench or standing together, and some of them look familiar, and you sit in your seat in your train and try to guess their stories. That was the premise of the play. I was also almost unconsciously forming a narrative of power the power of the patriarch over his family, the power of the rich over the poor, of authority over commoners, of male over female, etc. The Dark Lord began the journey and it continued right through the other place, Bhav, Rama, Platform, Five and Cast Party. At the cast party of Platform, again one of the main characters, when main actors took me aside and said, it's so wonderful how you were able to pick up from my life The role that he was doing, the character that he was doing, was almost like a reflection of his own life. That man later went on and became a big, uh, a, a, a big actor in Hindi films. He was uh, the, alt, the alternate hero in uh, a movie called Dev D and all that. So that man took me aside and said, how did you do this? How did you almost prophesy that uh, uh, my, my life uh, it's like this. Uh, he said the character has so much in common with my own life. I told him that I had no idea who would direct the play, much less who would act that role. Recently, just two weeks ago, we had a little uh, reading and a little show at, of our plays. So uh, we had a reading from my plays and an actor who is a seasoned performer in Tamil and English theatre told me the same thing. It was again set in a train, inside a train, for some, some co sort of coincidence. And uh, this actor, the character that this actor played, had so many shades that were so similar to what he did. He was also chosen just for that evening. 
on the spur of the moment and got in there. So in my play, Cast Party, there was also a play within a play in the beginning. And again, the toxic power of the aggressive narrative. It also took up the theme of an act, audience watching problematic relationships on the stage and passing comments on them. You normally, when you see a movie or uh, sit together and watch a movie or a play, and then you discuss what is happening there, such a toxic behavior, such a nasty man, such a uh, terrible woman, and you pass judgment on them without really realizing that you're, you're doing the same thing in your at home. So maybe your wife is sort of thinking, see, look at him, he's passing judgment on the character, but he's exactly like that. Or the husband may be thinking the same thing about the um, wife. So this is, in Cast Party, uh, this was one of the things. And the interesting things, it was, the, the backstory is set in the army. It uh, all goes, it's, uh, the whole thing happens in Wellington, and it is between two army men. And uh, this, this entire play is a reflection of what happened during that time, and uh, how it gets sorted out. Even in Midnight Hotel, which had ghosts and special effects and a lot of humor, the core theme was that of power and subjugation. And in Sisters, which came much later and was directed by Ajit Chituri, there was an old man in the first scene. And each successive scene took us back to his earlier years. The first scene is set in Mailapur. And there is this old man. And there are two old, two old women, mommies. And they are sisters. The second scene is set in Kerala. The same man, uh, younger. 20 years younger. And the two women there are also sisters. No, two women are also sisters, but they are nurses. And then 20 years earlier, the other thing is set in Goa. The same man when he was a young man. Again, two sisters, youngsters, young girls. They are sisters, but they are from a convent. So again, they are sisters. That's how this play goes. So the, uh, it goes full circle, only thing is in reverse. A word about the short story. I can't say for sure how many have been published because they have all been in anthologies and not in a book of their own. I think the best short stories depend on the reader to complete the experience. That's how it is, like a homeopathy pill. A small little thing which goes there and then it goes into your system and then it works. But it's just a small thing. A short story is short because of its format. But it's like a little pill that gets inside you and reaches into every part of you, sometimes forever. It's already con it already contains the muscle and bone, tissue and soul that will develop further when it is nourished by the reader's imagination. The most unusual story I wrote was that was for a Rupa publication anthology. It was based in Tiruvananthapuram, where I was born, and had a glimpse of the Sri Padmanabha Swami temple and discussed the student politics of that time. It was unusual because the first part was like a normal short story. And the second part was not only dramatic, but it was in the form of a play. The actual format was also in the form of a play. And now at this moment, I, right now, I have a novel and a play at hand. A section of the play was read recently. The one I told you about last two weeks ago, they read from this play also. It has a current period showing the floods in Chennai, and also a flashback to an earlier period showing the emergency and the Naxalites in Kerala, and also a kalari with a martial arts master. The play is called Romya and Paliath. Paliath is a place in Kerala, and there's this uh, the hero is from there, the protagonist is from there. And Romeo is a Bengali girl who comes from here to uh, learn Kalari. The novel is called Indian Scotch, and I started writing it exactly 20 years ago, when I was a writer in residence in Scotland. And it has flown along like the proverbial river through all my other work, children's books, novels, short stories, poetry, and plays. Every day I think I will reach the end of that novel, 
and then the next day I go back to it and start again. So that's where I rest my case. Uh, we, uh, thank you so much for having me here again on the precipice of the new year. Uh, if you have any questions. Uh, okay, audible. I'll read out these uh, questions. So how do you nurture and sustain your creativity, especially when faced with writer's block or creative stagnation? That's a very interesting. Can you hear me? Uh, okay. <clears throat> It's a very interesting question because for me, uh, writer's block generally happens when I'm writing a novel. Uh, so it's basically they are about 250 to 300 or 350 pages long. So in the course of that journey, that if there is a creative block, if there's a writer's block, what I do is that's when I start a play. It's a completely different ball game altogether. A play is a different format altogether. A play is a different uh, 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 way of getting into writing. So I put that away and then go into um, a play. Sometimes the, the whole play is over and then I get back to it. But sometimes I take it together. So I, earlier I used to suffer from um, writer's block, later I started celebrating my writer's block. I guess that answers the question. Now, the next one coming, how have other forms of art, such as music or visual arts, influenced your writing and creative process? How has it impacted your thinking when you are the grandson of Raja Ravi Varma? It feels nice to be grandson of Raja Rivarma. What, what else can I say? With such a legacy, such a huge uh, sort of... I mean, uh, as far as I'm concerned, when they ask me, what, what do you feel as a member of the royal family, as a senior member of the royal family, what, the only thing I can say is that uh, that family has gifted so much of arts and literature um, I don't know if you recognize these names, but other than Raja Ravi Varma and Swati Tirunal, there are also people like Kerala Kalidasa and people who have written poetry. Uh, Raja Ravi Varma himself was a wonderful poet. So those are the things that I'm so happy about. For a long time, I uh, did not let people know that I belong to such a family or I had such ancestors. So uh, people uh, knew about it much later. But then I realized that it's a great, great, great gift to be born in such a family and that I, I should be grateful for the fact that at least some of that little bit I'm able to sort of uh, use in my own way of... Uh, and as far as music and art are concerned, I'm inspired constantly, especially music. Music is something which is in me always like it runs like blood in my veins. That's something which... That's it. Yeah, I forgot to mention the names of... Uh, the first question came from uh, uh, Abhilash of Chennai, second one from Karthik of Kanjipuram. Now the next question coming from... Okay. Are there any upcoming projects or explorations you're planning to delve into regarding the multifaceted work of world of writers? Regarding multifaceted world of writers. 
I it would be know, that. Yes. Are there any upcoming projects or explorations you are planning to delve into regarding the multifaceted world of writers? Who is this? Who could you? This is any of Oh, it's online. Okay, I don't know about this multifaceted. That part of uh, there are things that I'm working on now. I, like I said, this 20-year-old novel, I have to finish it somehow and uh, make it good enough to, you know, work. But um, I don't know about this multifaceted. Uh, that I didn't get. <laughs> multifaceted world of writers. That is what the <coughs> what she said. Um, I didn't. I, I don't. Know, I don't know what to say. <laughs> yes. That's a, all right. Next question coming from Deepak of Velur. Why do you think storytelling remains such a powerful and enduring form of expression across cultures and generations? What's your advice to young professional to enhance reading reading habit? I'll tell you a small story. I don't know if it. Uh, if I should tell this to you, but I will anyway. Uh, just after my first novel, A Lament of Mohini, uh, I was asked to speak at a women's college in the city. So uh, since I live a little far away, I generally reach there very early or very late. So this time it was very early. So I went there and was sitting in the literature department, and they were uh, they were also inaugurating a literary magazine that day. So we were sitting there and chatting in the uh, uh, in the uh, literature uh, the uh, um, common the teachers' room, and then they said uh, in about uh, fifteen minutes time we can uh, go. They gave me snacks and coffee and things. And, then I said, is there a washroom I can visit? So she said, there is one downstairs. That is where everybody else goes. The visitors go. But the girls have their washroom here. If you are quick enough, you can go to the washroom, come back, and then go to the room. So I had about 10 or 15 minutes. So those days, Taking my courage in my hands, I just walked in. It was empty because classes were going on. I got into the cubicle, locked the door, finished everything. Just before I opened the door and came out, there was a scream of voices, and all the girls came into the room. And I'm inside that cubicle. This is the man who is going to inaugurate their literature association. <laughs> He's trapped in a cubicle in the washroom. So the scream of laughter and all that I can hear and I'm terrified. I knew then they started banging on the door. One one person started banging on the door. That was the, uh, I don't think even you would have faced all this in the army. <laughs> this was my moment of courage. <coughs> I just, because I had to go there, because after that this thing will start. I just opened the door and walked out and there was pin drop silence. <laughs> And I could see their faces. <laughs> I went straight, walked straight to the uh, room, the uh, lecturer's room, and they took me to the hall where everybody was waiting. All these girls were there. Some of them were giggling, some of them were looking at each other and nudging each other. But all silent, absolutely silent. Then th these lecturers didn't know what was happening. This is just, I went there and I came back and that's it. I released the book. I spoke for a few minutes. But 
they started asking questions, not the peep out of the girls. They are all either giggling or they are just <laughs> sitting there silently. Then to my horror, this uh, professor said, I think we, uh, they are shy, but just because we are sitting here, they are shy. So we leave you to, the, to it and they walked out. So I am sitting here and all those girls are there and I can see some of those girls from there. All of them are there. At this point of time, one girl got up and she said, I just finished reading Lament of Ohini. You should not have killed off that uncle. This is one of the most wonderful moments that can happen in any writer's life. That you have written a novel and here you are coming to inaugurate uh, a college, uh, a literary association uh, and I, you don't expect any of them to have read my novel and there this girl in this embarrassing situation when we, are, we don't know what to say to each other, this girl comes and asks, you shouldn't have killed off that uncle. That broke the tension and we were there. And then I said, um, uh, I went a little step further, I, was too, I think it must have uh, made a lot of impact on me. I said, you, now you just, if, what, what do you, what do you uh, suggest that I do to write? If I want to write, what do I suggest? I said, just throw away all the books that you're studying now and then start. Because your influence, uh, our inspiration lasts only for a certain time. After that, don't stick to it. Don't lean on somebody else's work. Have your own story to say. That's one good story. You can have storytelling. Now, uh, this is from Shakti of Dindigal. Have there been any mentors or significant figures in your life who have profoundly influenced your writing, writing journey? How have they impacted your approach to storytelling, particularly your associate with Mr. Mutaya? Mr. Mutaya was a, an early teacher. After that, for a long time, we didn't meet. Only after the Madras Book Club and all that, that did we meet. But he was always there. And uh, especially for the, my last uh, novel called uh, Kipling's Daughter, he was there for me. As far as inspiration, and uh, influences are concerned. I, like I said, uh, it's always better to be inspired and then move them aside and then take your own path. Um, my uh, my favorite writers those days were Agatha Christie, Arkenar, and Gabriel Marquez, and people like that. Uh, but I don't have somebody who I stick to or I keep sort of imitating or uh, inspired by all the time. Uh, this is something which I, uh, I mean, it's been a long journey, so I now I'm uh, virtually on my own. Uh, next is from Aditya of Chennai. In what ways do you believe life experiences enrich and influence artistic expression in writing? Does lack of experience restrict creativity, restrict creativity in writing? Absolutely. Where is Aditya? Aditya, his name is Aditya. Aditya. Oh, he's Chennai uh, online. Chennai. Oh, okay, okay. So, um, experience is absolutely necessary. When you are an art student and you are work, uh, studying in art school, uh, what they normally do is they take you out and uh, they take you out on a little pro, uh, excursion outside and you have to, you look at the trees and the skies and the flowers and all that and you are encouraged to draw. This is the same thing in writing. You read a lot so you know where you have to go, the path you have to take. But your experiences are what makes it. Much of my uh, work is, uh, reflects my life. So much of my work is personal, and that's how it uh, rings true. That's how it becomes genuine. You can't uh, sort of have other people's templates and then work on that. It has to be your own experience. In fact, uh, famously, uh, uh, Ernest Hemingway is supposed to have said, he, actually he didn't say it, uh, 
uh, if you google it you'll find that he did not say it but it's attributed to him uh, he used to, he used to say uh, write while you're drunk and edit while you're sober any work it doesn't mean that you get get sozzled and then you write it means that don't put a block to what you don't put a stop just keep writing whatever comes to you completely get yourself out of that mood by writing the entire gamut of feelings that come to you later on you have to edit editing is something done by an almost an external force there we are without experience someone like me would have never written so the see, experience has to be there so now uh, this is from praveen of chennai how do you perceive the note of humanity and human experience in the stories and narratives you create i perceive that only after i have written it when i read it again while i'm doing it it's a completely uh, it's an idea comes to me like for example i told you about this maria's room being in a taxi in the rain and two people getting in and i get this idea so these ideas come from all over the place it's all over the place everything that even now i might find something which could make up a novel sitting here and looking at all of you there might be some thing some little element which catches my attention and that's there and that's how it has to be some little small thing which you take and develop and then you uh, it goes on and on if it's and i have these choices also it could be a poem it could be a short story it could be a novel or it could be a play so you can place it anywhere if it is worth placing so it's a it's something which uh, depends on you how curious are you and for me the fact of having been a journalist earlier helped me a lot that curiosity that noticing that awareness all that helps yeah <clears throat> next is from varshini kaliyappan of chennai what are some of the most profound influences and passions that have shaped your creative existence as a writer poet and journalist there are so many incidents so many events uh, about uh, two years ago somebody told me some an old classmate of mine from school told me uh, of all our classmates i can believe anybody else would have gone through any of all these experiences but i can't believe that you have gone through all these experiences because when i was studying uh in my school in my uh, when i was in uh, uh, primary school i was in i was in good shepherd convent that's where i started so and i was uh, staying just behind the school so while everybody else took the bus or walked i was taken in a car to the front gate this uh, we were staying at the back of the school and i was taken in a car in the front uh, taken to the front and then that's how we went to school from that to uh, traveling by train every day to uh, christian college and then going to bombay and doing night shifts and going into so many areas of bombay that nobody ever uh, uh, residents would have ever ever visited so that that i am going into the thick of the film industry there are so many experiences to which have shaped my writing which i don't think many other people would not have experienced as a journalist how do you navigate the ethical challenges that arise in storytelling especially when dealing with existing uh, with sensitive or contra- controversial topics and also your views of, of fake news fake news is something that cannot be stopped because the sheer magnitude of the social media thing anybody can write anything and i don't know unless there's some uh, thing which comes through which stops it automatically but otherwise i think there is a certain i i still remember once when i was working in indian express uh, it was a huge hall indian express was one lok satta was the other that's a marathi paper there were so many sections the screen 
uh, film paper was one, the, econo the, uh, uh, the financial express was in another huge hall with sections. And I still remember uh, one man uh, sitting with his, sitting against the wall in a chair with his feet up and a little transistor to his ear. And he's listening to something. So finally, afterwards, we asked him, what is he listening to? He said, I'm listening to the commentary. Instead of going there to one Kedi Stadium and watching the match and writing about it, he's sitting there. And so that much of a little, uh, uh, faithfulness or uh, 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 a sort of uh, responsibility towards your job, it, it, becomes, it becomes an easy thing. Once, once, uh, uh, if you have a reporter and he's covering something, it's so easy to sort of overstep a few uh, uh, tasks and then reach the thing easy way out. Uh, so that that's what makes these things. It's not. I don't think it's de anybody deliberately wants to, you know, uh, uh, do this. Uh, I, I think it's a this faithlessness is born of an easy way out. Instead of questioning four people involved in a thing, you just take two responses and then you go away. And those other two are left hanging in the air. Yeah. Now, Satish from uh, Tanjau, how do you perceive the evolution of writing and storytelling in today's uh, digital age? What opportunities and challenges does it present? the impact of AI on creativity? AI? AI. Uh, my son is an illustrator in Bangalore. He uh, almost every day uh, uh, he curses the advent of AI because all jobs, everything is taken away by AI. Uh, so that's one thing which I don't know what, there must be something which happens. Uh, I mean, which uh, may, maybe in the future something can happen. But as far as the evolution of writing is concerned, I think uh, I remember when uh, we were in uh, Bombay for a, we had a little uh, conversation between the writers. Salma, the Tamil writer, was there. Uh, uh, some other two or three people were there. There was this panel discussion, and we had so much of Kindle, and so, so will the Kindle replace the book? And uh, we said, this was about uh, 10, 15 years ago. And we said, no, the book will continue to bring and you had the spell of the pages and the feel of the books and things of that are such a, but you never know, the attention span is so reduced nowadays. So uh, there are lovers of books and there are people who sort of, you know, don't, maybe through their journeys or when it's necessary, they use a book. It doesn't, so this, I, I, we can't really predict it. It's because uh, the last 20 years have been the fastest changing times that we have ever experienced. So you never know what's happening, what's coming. Next is from Suha, Suhasri of Chennai. Can you share some of the challenges you have, you have faced and the revelations you have had on your journey as a writer? Is it... Uh, Seaside for the young. What do it? See, seaside for the young to taste writing as a profession. Uh, yeah, is it seaside? She has written for the for the yeah seaside for the young to. <laughs> I don't think okay. it's uh, right. uh, anyone wish to risk making writing your profession. Uh, even uh, Chetan Bhagat was doing something else when he started writing. And uh, his first, he used to uh, give his first few chapters free. Uh, I think along with the, uh, in the supermarket or something like that, along with the grocery, two chapters of Chetan Shah free. And then they look for the book later. So uh, Chetan Bhagat, sorry. Uh, so, uh, so that... I don't. I don't think it's. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, it's. It's not. Uh, you can write. 
you can do something and then write. And if you become a big name, then of course, you, you, uh, you can't be like some Jeffrey Archer or some uh, money-making machines who uh, write and then uh, make money that way. I don't think that's possible. But uh, for the, if you write for the love of writing, it is always possible that you will get somewhere. If you write to make money, it's like any other business. You have to learn little ABCs of the alphabets of writing and make uh, an industry out of it. But I don't think that happens and that will happen. I personally feel you must write for the love of writing. That's more important. Now we I have. I think we are two, five minutes fast. That's why he's looking at the watch. <laughs> No, uh, now we have Akash from Coimbatore. What qualities do you believe define the indomitable spirit of writers, enabling them to persevere through challenges and continue storytelling? What's your views of ghost writing? Ghost writing is a business. That, that's a business. That's a business. But there are people who are very good at writing, but their names are not so big. So what they do is they write for other people. And those people are already famous. Maybe a sportsman, maybe an actor, maybe a, some sort of person like that. And then you write. There are so many people. And sometimes the ghost writers are not even there. The names are not even featured anywhere. So it's just the name of the, uh, the celebrity. I remember somebody talking, a cousin telling me about an instance in Bombay when uh, his neighbor used to write songs and it was uh, given to a music director as the work of Anand Bakshi. Anand Bakshi used to, uh, you know, outsource his work at one point of time. There was so much of work he had that he used to outsource it to some really good poets outside. So if a person like Anand Bakshi can do that, I guess there are people uh, who can make money out of that sort of a thing also. Okay, now we got Rajisha from Chennai, could you share a personal anecdote or experience that encapsulates the essence of a writer's life beyond writing? What's your personal experience in this context? Isn't it getting late? <laughs> no, it's <that's> fine. <laughs> first, so you first, already gave one anecdote. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, I can't think of any uh, writers. But I think that should, one, one anecdote for the evening should be enough. <laughs> now, next one is from Kathil of Chennai. Can you elaborate on what inspired you to explore the intricate world beyond the pages of literature? The pages of literature. <laughs> exactly. Now, we have. Right. Next one is from uh, Sanjana of uh, Sri City. How has your personal growth and life experiences, uh, aside of writing, influenced the themes and narratives you explore in your work? The same thing, that uh, what you live through, it's, if it's exciting enough, it seeps into your literature and much of my work reflects my own life. There, and there have been amazing uh, instances which are not uh, sort of maybe part of a, anybody else's life. I've, I've gone through so many different uh, experiences, so many unbelievable experiences, and I think they are all sort of all came, come to roost in my writing. Now you have this question from Daniel from Bangalore. Do you have any specific rituals or routines that you follow while writing? How do they contribute to your creative discipline? Earlier, I used to write when I wanted to write, when I felt like writing, when the urge was on. But uh, it's best to have a certain time limit. Uh, you say, if you're going to write at 7 o'clock, go there and sit there. Whether something is coming or not, just sit there and see. Uh, that's what I have been advising my friends as well who wanted to write books. Just go there, sit there, uh, carve out one hour for you, uh, half an hour for you, and then see if you can write during that time. That's uh, safe formula. And one more thing is that uh, this inspiration or this imagination is like uh, electricity. It is always there in the air. But when you channelize it and 
put it somewhere there and then switch on the light, then it comes there. Like that, this inspiration, this thought, this idea is always there in your mind. It's when you sit down to write that it, you're channelizing it to write, but it's always flowing. I think this is the last online question. Can you discuss the role of culture and heritage in shaping your perspectives and narratives as a writer? This is Kash Kashika from Namakal. That's absolutely a wonderful question because uh, just after my first novel, uh, there was a shipload of uh, people who came, foreigners who came here, and they wanted to meet uh, local writers and uh, playwrights and things like that, and we had this discussion. And uh, they were from uh, the US, from UK, all sorts of places. And uh, every time, whatever question they asked, it was about myself, my culture. So if you, uh, uh, even when I went to Scotland, uh, a lot of people told me you read about Scotland, read about the people there, read about, read the literature there, and then go there. But the questions they asked me was about my culture, my upbringing, my social background and things like that. So that is what they're interested in. So if you are rooted in your culture, you don't have to keep spouting it all the time. But it helps you to grow and it helps your work also to grow because that's something like, uh, uh, it's, it nurtures your art. Yeah. From audience question, is your creative thinking at the early part of the day because you have passion for music, drawing, and writing. This is from Wing Commander Gurudanath Reddy. Uh, early part of the day, in the sense? Your, your, does your creative thinking take place in the early part of the day? That's what his question is. Early part of the day is not really when I wake up, because <laughs> I wake up a little late. It's the, towards the night. I have a terrible problem. Uh, because of these night shifts, when I was in Bombay in, with the paper, uh, my, I sleep late, so that's when I keep do write my writing. Otherwise, the best part of the day, the morning is the best part of the day when you can write, actually. But for me, it, unfortunately, it is towards the uh, uh, later part of the day. You're not an, you're not an early riser. Uh, not, uh, not till I force myself to do it. <laughs> okay. The last question is from Mr. Jairaj. Life is stranger than fiction. Please comment. That will take another meeting because I, I absolutely agree. Nothing that I have read has been, uh, I mean, maybe a little bit of what I've read has been stranger than what I have experienced, what I have seen. People I've met and unexpected things that have happened to me, it's completely, and it, some of them are in my plays and in my novels as well, short stories as well. It was quite an exhaustive interactive session, so we will come to the end of that. Just to let everyone know, this event has not only garnered a full house audience at MMA, but also 540 online viewers currently. 540 online viewers currently. So, <laughs> I now request Group Captain Vijay Kumar to present a memento to our chief guest on behalf of MMA. Okay. Request Mr. Nagraj, a past president of MMA, to come on stage as well. Yeah. 
Okay, that's it. Scott, you are. Sir, I now request Captain Ramchandran to present a memento to our chief guest on behalf of Colors of Glory Foundation. I now invite Captain Ramchandran for his closing remarks and to propose the vote of thanks. That's been a wonderful evening. I, I, I'm very glad to see that our uh, audience are predominantly young. I'm sure you're, you all have been benefited a lot, which, I mean, especially those of you who want to pursue a literary career. I mean, uh, you had such wonderful inputs. So, do right. There, there, there is, it, it's a, no, I'm a, I'm a very moderate writer, but it, it, it is quite a, an absorbing experience. So please remember that. So the, um, thank you very much, Mr. Srikumar Verma, for making this evening so wonderful with your, with your what should I say, <laughs> brilliant uh, lecture. And um, thank you, every, thank, I, I, I wish to thank everyone, elders, as well as the uh, young crowd who is here to make this, uh, who have made this event a, a memorable one. And those 500 odd uh, online, uh, online uh, viewers as well. Uh, thank you very much. I don't want to hold you anymore. We have uh, already uh, sort of nearing the time. Thank you and uh, good night. Please hold on, please hold on. MC may have something to you. Can we please rise for the national anthem, please?